still here. Uh, welcome you back to our embarrassment and riches. <laughs> and we have another wonderful panel uh, which will be focusing on African American historiography, past and present. And we have two speakers. We are very fortunate and honored to have these two speakers who are Gira Dagobi, who is a professor of history at Michigan State University. Um, he's also the graduate director and associate chair in the Department of History there, and a core faculty member of the African American and African Studies PhD program at MSU. He is prolific and accomplished. His books include Black History, Old School Black Historians and the Hip Hop Generation, uh, which came out in 2006, the Early Black History Movement, 2007, that is the Early Black History Movement, Carter G. Woodson and Lorenzo Johnston Green, which came out in 2007, and African American History Reconsidered, uh, which came out uh, almost three years ago. His current project is What is African American History? A big question, and we're looking forward to that. That would be coming out at Polity in Cambridge. Um, we are also honored to have with us Professor Robin Turbock Penn, University Professor Emerita of Morgan State University, um, where she served as Professor of History and the coordinator of the graduate programs in history. Her research and writing include over 40 articles and seven books, including African American Women in the Struggle for the Vote, 1850 to 1920, and the anthology Women in Africa and the African Diaspora, a reader, which was published in 2013 by Black Classic Press. In 2012, she won the Association of Black Women Historians Letitia Wood Brown Prize for the best 2011 article about black women, which was Migration and Transracial trans National Identity Reformation, Becoming African Diaspora Women, which is following on the theme that was raised there. I'm sure uh, there will be issues that will be addressed in the published in Black Women, Gender, and Families for 2011. Professor Tabrok Penn has been active in the historical profession for many years, including um, a member of several program committees for the Association for the Study of African American Life and History. She was a co-founder and the first national director of the Association of Black Women Historians and the founding executive committee member of the Association for the Study of the Worldwide African Diaspora. In 2010, uh, she completed a two-year term on the executive board of the Association of Caribbean Historians. She's the recipient of numerous awards for scholarship and service to the historical profession. For example, in 2008, the Association for the Study of African American Life and History awarded her the Carter G. Woodson Medallion. And in 2010, the Southern Historical Association awarded her the John Glassingham Prize for Distinguished Scholarship and Mentorship in African American. Um, as I said, the, the topic um, is African American historiography, past and present. Our discussant is uh, our own Professor Nollyway Brooks, who is the author of three books, Hair Raising, Beauty, Culture, and African American Women, um, Ladies' Pages, African American Women's Magazines, and the Culture That Made Them, and uh, White Money, Black Power, The Surprising History of African American Studies and the Crisis of Race in Higher Education. Um, I'd like to invite Professor Dagobi to give his paper, which is titled Robert L. Harris, Jr., African American Historiography and the Black Historical Enterprise. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the introduction and good afternoon. Um, it's my great pleasure to be participating on this panel and symposium celebrating the long career and enduring contributions of Robert L. Harris Jr. to African American historiography, the multidisciplinary black studies and Africana studies here at Cornell University. It's nice to be back here. I had the opportunity to be here about a year ago presenting a paper during a spring Africana Speakers Series, and I was more than impressed with the hospitality and the intellectual engagement, and I have witnessed the same thus far, so I'm indebted uh, and humbled 
to have been invited here. When I was informed by uh, Professor Hassan that I could present on anything that I was researching in the field, <laughs> I thought that since much of my work is about the deeper philosophical meanings of black history and the history of the profession, that it would be timely to talk about Professor Harris and his scholarship directly. For after all, Dr. Harris's living history and history, as Edward Hallett Carr teaches us, would not exist without the historian, of course. Now, I have not known him as long as many here today. I first formally met him at the 91st Annual Association for the Study of African American Life and History Convention in Atlanta, Georgia in 2006. I eagerly introduced myself to him because I had recently discovered that he was one of the outside peer reviewers for a book of mine that was published by Illinois in 2007. So I spotted him in the lobby area with some of his friends, and I went up to him and expressed my gratitude for him so rigorously reviewing my book before its publication. And he smiled, and I think he patted me on the shoulder, and he said something like this, and maybe if I'm misquoting the historian, <laughs> but he said, sorry, I had to put you through all that revising. I just wanted to make sure you got it right. He <laughs> let out a contained chuckle that was echoed by the laughter of his colleagues. And as I walked away, I'm sure they were telling little jokes about me. <laughs> Indeed, it was a meeting of two distinct generations of black historians. I was born in the era during which he earned his credentials as a professional historian. I had no choice. I belonged to a younger generation of black scholars who had often been accused of resting their oars on the accomplishments of those who came of age during the Civil Rights Black Power Movement. I had to pay deference to the elders, and I didn't mind it because this is what I research a lot. Several months ago in preparation for this talk, I revisited the reviews that Dr. Harris submitted in 2004 for my book. Yes, I still have them. I'm a historian. I keep things. <laughs> While he commented that I had produced a very insightful manuscript, he offered some critiques and straightforward plain talk. He was most critical of what he called my presentist approach and my discussion of hip-hop and hip-hop generation historians. In my mind, I was justified in my approach based upon the musings of early Thorpe and John Bill Franklin, who often tell us every generation has the obligation to interject their own interpretations of the black past. I did not, of course, bring this up in my response, for I was on a mission. I just wanted to get published and keep my tender strain job. <laughs> After I thoroughly responded in writing to the first set of critiques, he was still not satisfied, writing to the editor that was passed on to me, quote, I'm still troubled by the last three pages of the conclusion. Before, I was troubled by the last 10 pages. <laughs> <laughs> I suggest that Dan Bovey read Benjamin Crow's brilliant essay, Black History's Diversified Clientele. Maybe he will then have a more nuanced approach to the purpose of African American history and the role of the black scholar, end quote. I was, to say the least, vexed. Uh, with my bruised ego, I made another set of revisions to satisfy his concerns, and he finally granted his approval. Yes, I was hazed, and yes, my study was tighter because of Professor Harris's review. In pushing me to address quarrels, which I had read, he was insisting that my generation, I believe, as a whole, not underestimate the quote-unquote old school. And in the end, I guess he rewarded me with a glowing blurb on the back of my book. As the years passed, I realized that I was clearly not alone in being constructively critiqued by Professor Harris. Since the 1970s, he has routinely published book reviews in a range of leading scholarly and historical journals, from journals such as the Negro Digest that later became the Black World, to journals such as the Journal of American History. His reviews are consistently balanced and often critical. One that I recently read stood out to me. In 1976, he reviewed Philip S. Fawner's 1975 History of Black Americans. Harris opened the review by praising and historicizing Fawner's efforts. He wrote, quote, it has been more than 90 years since historian George Washington Williams published in two volumes his pioneering study, History of the Negro Race in America. Until now, no single author has attempted to write a multi-volume history of Afro-Americans. At age 65, the indefatigable white historian Philip S. Fawner has accepted the challenge, end quote. Later in his review, he judiciously critiqued the work, underscoring, quote, in large measure, this book is more a study of blacks in American history than it is a history of black America. The dominant group is his referent as he pits white actions against black reactions. He fails to assess the internal dimensions of the slave and free black communities. In sum, his approach is more institutional, anchoring itself in political and economic as opposed to social, culture, and intellectual history, end quote. 
Here, Harris spoke to an essential concept that deeply concerned African American historians during and since the Black Power era. That is, the basic empowering of African American figures with agency. Before first meeting Dr. Harris about seven years ago, I was aware of who he was. I was introduced to a scholarship as a graduate student during the mid to late 1990s. I distinctly remember being told by my mentor, Dr. Darlene Clark Hine and Wilma King, that I needed to familiarize myself with his seminal 1982 Journal of Negro History essay entitled Coming of Age, The Transformation of Afro-American Historiography. For me, this document is an illuminating secondary and primary source. It is essential required reading for those of us intrigued in the development of the black historical profession. Now, in the remainder of this paper, I touch upon probably too many things, but I'm going to try and do it anyway. Number one, I overview the state of the black historical profession in African American historiography during a time that seems, among others, I am sure to have profoundly impacted Professor Harris, this being the 1980s. Number two, I highlight Harris's contributions to our knowledge on the evolution of the black historical profession, African American historiography, and the teaching of black history. And lastly, number three, I situate the role of historians like Harris in African American studies or Africana studies. My overall discussion is framed by reflections on and citations from Harris's scholarship. Therefore, I'm using his scholarship as my main body of primary documentation. Along with historians like L.D. Reddick, Early Thorpe, John Hope Franklin, Benjamin Quarles, Vincent Harding, Sterling Stuckey, Darwin Clark Hine, among others, Harris significantly helped sharpen mind and other ideas about the evolution and the meaning of African American history as a distinct intellectual endeavor. During the 1970s and 80s, Harris was among the handful of historians to attempt to more explicitly define black history in theoretical terms, something that African American historians have not done in the same manner that, let's say, German or British historians have. Harris's conceptualization of African American history was pragmatic and directly linked to teaching. In 1983, he wrote an essay in the journal called The Social Studies entitled From Inclusion to Interpretation, Teaching African American History in the 1980s. After pointing out the limitation in mainstream textbooks portrayals of black America, he outlined the educational function of black history. He deduced the following, quote, the Afro-American past should be explored in a manner to help students appreciate the historical circumstances of America's largest racial minority, to understand their thoughts and activities, to recognize the pluralistic nature of American society, to realize the challenges posed to the ideals of freedom, justice, and democracy, and to discover the continuing quest for an equitable America. The objectives can only be achieved by teachers with a sense of the meaning of Afro-American experience within American history. With a sound conceptualization of the African-American past, they can move beyond the textbooks to stimulate student involvement in the process of historical analysis. Students need to know the past, but in a way that engages them in historical thinking. Otherwise, they are not apt to develop critical skills to assist them in making informed judgments about the course and direction of the American nation." End quote. It's striking to me how relevant these observations are to the present state of things. Mark Block argued in his Soul Searching the Historian's Craft that the faculty of understanding the living is the master quality of the historian. A careful study of African American history clearly demonstrates that the contemporary problems facing blacks are the byproducts of various pasts and incidents that are impacted by contemporary developments and interpretive models and related to future trends. In the early 1990s, Harris published Teaching African American History, a pamphlet for the mainstream American Historical Association. In this work, he essentially summarizes the broad trends in African American history from black Americans' African origins through the modern civil rights movement. He suggested that the transitions from Africa to America, slavery to freedom, countryside to city, and segregation to civil rights provide, in his words, a conceptual framework for organizing the Afro-American experience thematically and chronologically, and for incorporating it in the trajectory of American history. His chart is useful for teaching, highlighting four major transformations in his mind. That is the overriding change process, the turning point, the watershed years, and the transformation of the majority of African Americans. At the end of the 1990s, Harris continued to theorize the challenges of teaching African American history in a viewpoints column in the AHA's Perspectives entitled Dilemmas in Teaching African American History. Among the relevant issues that he posited was the need for teachers to strike a balance between what sociologist Orlando Patterson called the catastrophic and the survivalist interpretations of black history. In my own work, I suggest similar things, saying that we need to maintain a balance between notions of victimization and oppression and resistance and perseverance. 
Harris has produced historical scholarship during five decades. I was recently reminded of the scope and enduring quality of his work. Last semester, I was asked by the editor of a historical journal to review an article submission on Daniel Alexander Payne Murray. Now, to be honest with you, I was not really familiar with Murray, so I did what most of us do when dealing with phenomenon that's obscured to us. I searched on the internet, looked on JSTOR, ProQuest, Project Muse, Google Scholar, you all know the trip. Of the two major relevant scholarly sources, both articles that I located, one was written by Harris in 1976. The essay is entitled, Daniel Murray and the Encyclopedia of the Colored Race, and appeared in Phyla. After reading this piece, I concluded in my reader's report that the author really did not add anything new to what Harris posited was 35 years ago. And in fact, the individual had the nerve to state that there's only been two articles done and they're old. And I said, well, you haven't done anything. In his essay, Harris challenged the conventional thinking of the time that still persists today, I should add, that W.E.B. Du Bois was the first major African American star to propose the publication of a massive encyclopedia of African peoples. Depunking this misconception, Harris provided a detailed biographical sketch of Murray, highlighting his 52-year career at the Library of Congress beginning in 1871. Clearly, as Harris demonstrates, Murray was a leading figure in the African American community in Washington, D.C. during the immediate post-Reconstruction era and the nadir. Murray often testified before Congress and offered a regular column in the voice of the Negro newspaper. Harris had discovered a key amateur historian of the black past, who, according to his contemporaries, was more knowledgeable about, about Negro history than any other man in America at the time. In summarizing the significance of Murray's life and work, Harris ascertained the following. Quote, Daniel Murray dared to dream and to work towards such an enterprise in the Encyclopedia Africana long before the nation or even many black people were ready for it, end quote. I've been interested in the history of the black historical profession since my days as a graduate student. After first reading it, I was deeply troubled by August Meyer and Elliot Rudwick's 1986 monumental book, Black History and the Historical Profession, 1915 to 1980. Fortunately, established scholars like Professor Harris challenged their interpretations. Harris's conceptualization of the black historical profession was at odds with the Eurocentric approach of these once white deans of African American history. In a 1987 review of their study in the very mainstream American Historical Review, a journal that, as Earl E. Lewis pointed out, has only published two articles by black historians from 1910 until 1980, um, Harris dubbed their approach, I'm talking about journal articles, not reviews, but journal articles. Du Bois did an article in HR in 1910, John Hope Franklin began the second <laughs> after him to do a real article in 1980, HR. Don't be surprised if you get rejected today. Um, <laughs> Harris dubbed their approach narrow, biased, and elitist. He critiqued their analysis of black Americans by saying that they looked at it through the filter of Americanism without paying attention to Africa. He also challenged their notion that black historians came from so-called non-ideological backgrounds, whereas white historians who are interested in black history came from clear ideological backgrounds, whatever that means. In a 1994 essay in the Journal of American Ethnic Studies, Harris similarly challenged prolific US historian John Hyam for ignoring 19th century African American historical associations in his 1984 study on immigrants to the United States that discussed early American historical organizations. Harris cited important groups that many overlook even today, such as the Philadelphia American Negro Historical Society, the Negro Society for Historical Research based out of New York, and the more familiar American Negro Academy. Unlike Meyer and Rudwick, Harris broadly subdivides the black historical profession into two major periods that are easily digestible by readers, pre- and post-civil rights black power movement African-American historiography. In Harris's view, the roots of black history as a field can be traced back to antebellum era with self-trained scholars like James W.C. Pennington, Robert Benjamin Lewis, and William Cooper Nell. Echoing John Hope Franklin, Harris argued that George Washington Williams, quote, certainly merits consideration as a progenitor of Afro-American historiography, end quote. And this is something that Myron Rudwick certainly did not agree with because they limited their study to only doctorate holders. After looking at Williams, um, Harris logically stressed the role of Du Bois and Woodson and the association 
in the role of creating black history as a discipline. Historians have debated when African American history became legitimized in the mainstream US historical profession. It's safe to say that sometime between 1969 and 1974, African American history gained a noticeable sense of mainstream appeal in the US historical profession. According to Harris, the Civil Rights Movement, the Irving Uprisings, the Black Consciousness Movement forced a reassessment of the Black American experience in the United States. His assessment here is accurate. By the early 1980s, he optimistically reflected, quote, this groundswell of interest in the Afro-American past permeated practically every sector of American society, end quote. The 1980s, when Harris wrote several important essays on African-American historiography, was a very important decade in the evolution of black history as a field of study. It was an exciting and optimistic period for the study of black history. During this decade, the study of black history, the profession, and African-American historiography had reached a noteworthy level of recognition and legitimacy, and I understand the problems with this term, in the US Academy. Though inextricably bound to the important advancements in previous stages of development, the 80s represents a watershed decade in the maturation of African American historiography. Like their predecessors, black historians of the 80s seem to have been keenly aware of their discipline's growth. At the dawning of the decade of the 80s, Harris noted, quote, the writing of black history has evolved to the point that we are now able to sketch the conceptual and methodological issues that give it a coherence of its own, end quote. Then towards the closing of the decade, he reflected upon a key juncture. Quote, is in, in his words, the conference on the study and teaching of Afro-American history held at Purdue University in 1983 represented the flowering of Afro-American history, end quote. At the closing of the decade, David Levering Lewis echoed him, stating that black historiography had reached its full adulthood. Like the late 80s and early 90s vis-a-vis -vis hip hop culture and music, the 80s kind of represents a kind of golden age for African American history. During the 1980s, scores of path-breaking historical books were published. This maturation and innovation was epitomized by the development of African American women's history. The foundations for the institutionalization of black women's history are rooted in the 1980s, building upon key works in the 70s published by scholarly, co scholars like Professor Turbor Pett. The 80s was also a fruitful decade for research on the study of black history. Two seminal works were done in 1986 alone. The book that I mentioned by Myron Rudwick about the historical profession, and a book edited by Professor Darling Clark Hine that was called Black History and the Historical, uh, uh, or The State of Afro-American History, Past, Present, and Future. Building upon scholarship by Early Thorpe and others, these studies were pioneering. Harris was himself a part of the conversation of the field and profession's future and needs for the future. In the early 80s, in the tradition of the National Council of Black Studies mantra, academic excellence, social responsibility, he called upon his colleagues to be practical. He said this, Afro-Americans cannot cloister themselves in the ivory towers. Afro-American historiography must be more utilitarian than aesthetic, as the Afro-American historian's purpose should be to examine the past as it relates specifically to black people for greater understanding of the present and for informed decisions about the future. He also called upon future historians of the black past to integrate the study of Africa more and place it within a global context. The place of Africa has certainly been acknowledged by black historians and was the topic of a brilliant uh, paper by Professor Gaines and is the topic of one of his more recent works on the, the African-American Ghanaian uh, connection. Yet integrating black history in a global or transnational context is a more recent phenomenon. And Professor Washington's talk addresses African American history as this transnational concept during a period that has not really been focused on as much. It seems that most of this discussion is dealing with like the Cold War era, the Civil Rights Movement, and the Black Power era. Harris was talking about, at least calling for this early as well, Harris's vision of black history's function is central to the pragmatic, diagnostic nature of black studies. Professionally trained as a historian, Harris has, of course, also been active in black studies. He belongs to a tradition of historians who have done such. And I don't mean to, like, you know, make a hierarchy of those who have contributed to black studies by putting historians at the top. So I apologize in advance if I offend anyone from my <laughs> Historians have played an important role. <laughs> During the proto-black studies movement, that is before 
the, the, the late 60s. Many professionally trained black historians helped lay the foundations of black studies. Like their black studies progeny, they produced scholarship that was directly linked to the black struggle for social justice. Much of Du Bois' scholarship, such as the Philadelphia Negro, the Atlanta University Studies of Negro Problems, and his writings as editor of The Crisis, directly linked scholarship with a quest for social change. Woodson and his association co-workers produced scholarship that was to sample from Manning Marable per his discussion of black studies as a black intellectual tradition, descriptive, prescriptive, and corrective. At many levels, the association was the quintessential proto-black studies movement organization that clinched onto the notion of scholarship linked to social activism. During the area from the black power period until the present, scores of historians have played key roles in black studies. Historians were part of the first programs, were present at various national conferences, and played roles in evaluating black studies later. In 1973, slavery historian John W. Blasingame authored one of the first books on black studies, New Perspective on Black Studies. In 1985, historian Nathan Huggins wrote a controversial report a report to the Ford Foundation on Afro-American Studies that, according to at least one scholar, fostered debate in regards to the structure, content, and direction of African-American studies. In 1990, historians Professor Harris and Darlene Clark Hine authored two of the essays in the Ford Foundation's book entitled Three Essays, Black Studies in the United States. Harris's thoughts on the development of black studies continue to be required readings for students in the field. His essays, for example, appear in two of the key black studies readers published in the New Millennium. That is, Routledge's The Black Studies Reader and Nathaniel Norman Jr.'s The African American Studies Reader. Today, historians, along with others, continue to help the discipline. In his study on black studies as a social movement, Fabio Roja offers some interesting data about black studies. His findings were based on research surveys that he conducted in 2003 and 2004 academic year. He concluded that there were about 855 professors of African American studies. Of the 762 black studies professors with doctorates that Roja evaluated, the doctoral degrees by discipline of those involved in teaching and researching black studies reveal interesting results. History accounts for almost 20%. English, 13%. Sociology, about 11%. Political science, about 11%. Anthropology, about 7.5%. Only about 6.5% of those teaching and researching in the field of quote unquote black studies have PhDs in black studies. And this shouldn't be a surprise if we know the history of black studies and how Temple you know, was the first to have a PhD in black studies in the later uh, 1980s. An issue in the Journal of Blacks in Higher Education in the early 2000s revealed that very few black students are majoring in black studies. For instance, in 2003, less than 0.7% of all bachelor's degrees awarded to blacks were in black studies. And for the same year, only 1.3% of blacks to earn bachelor's degrees were history majors. On the other hand, in 2003, 25% of all degrees awarded to blacks were in business. Now, these statistics are almost 10 years old, but I highly doubt that they've changed much. And we really shouldn't be too surprised with these statistics. In this new millennium, we face the challenge of recruiting young black men and women to major and study, you know, black history and African American studies. We need to cultivate a new generation of black studies doctorates. While the websites for black studies programs routinely advertise the many things one can do with a degree in the field, not a PhD, but just a bachelor's degree. In the end, it seems that we're really looking for those willing to sacrifice for the advancement of African American people. As the history of the field demonstrates, black studies was created out of the black struggle. As Professor Rooks's and others' works have highlighted, black studies is a direct byproduct and manifestation of black power position in the academy. African American history is now certainly an established and flowering field of scholarly endeavor with its own frequently invoked traditions, visible institutions, distinctive theoretical constructs and methods, lively subspecialties, vast historiography, and recognizable niche in mainstream US profession as demonstrated today. Today, it is easy to conclude that African American history has a secure presence in the mainstream academy. It's now embarrassing for major research institutions not to have experts in African American history among the members of their history departments. Mainstream university and popular press, uh, presses now regularly publish books on black history, and several leading university presses have sustained and established African American history and studies series. In April 2012, recently deceased historian Manny Marble won a Pulitzer Prize in the category of history 
for his biography, Malcolm X, A Life of Reinvention. According to the American Historical Association's most recent directory of history departments, history organizations, and historians, African American history is one of the three topical fields that has shown an increase among recent PhDs from 2001 to about 2010. Such recent progress, however, must be viewed critically and properly historicized in a similar manner that the notion of African American advancement since the emergence of a so-called post-racial American society with the recent re-election of Obama as the nation's president again must be accurately deconstructed and de-romanticized. The struggle of African American history as a field mirrors the African American historical experience and the struggle of black people. Like many African Americans vis-a-vis -vis mainstream US institutions, it could be argued that African American history as a field still operates at the margins of the mainstream US historical profession. The legacy of this once marginal status is still evident. For instance, there is still only one major, one major journal devoted to African American experience. That is the Journal of African American History, founded as the Journal of Negro History in 1915. And I acknowledge the fact that there are black studies journals that incorporate history, but I'm talking about a major journal here that's just focusing on black history. While mainstream historical associations like the OAH, the AHA, the Southern have routinely included panels on African American history for the last several decades. The annual conventions of the Association for the Study of African American Life and History, for which Dr. Harris served as president from 1991 to 1993, continues to be probably the most important intellectual space for scholarly exchanges about black history and are predominantly attended by black scholars and lay historians. Many African-American historians, the primary practitioners of the field, continue to face a wide array of challenges existing at predominantly white institutions of higher education, and even, yes, publishing their scholarship in mainstream scholarly journals. Courses in African-American history and black studies continue to serve as oftentimes supplements to the normative US history surveys offered by colleges and universities throughout the nation. And what I mean by this is that oftentimes, General US surveys don't have to deal with black people, and students will be told, just go take a history class that's on black people, where if you study American history, you've got to put black people to center, especially if you're dealing with you know, the period up through slavery. It's impossible not to do that. Um, certain types of historical scholarship on African American history were and have been more receptive in the mainstream than others. The 2012 volume of the Journal of African American History openly supported, in unapologetic terms, the controversial reparations movement, for instance, is not likely to receive a hearing in mainstream circles. Nevertheless, since the late 60s, scholarship on African American history has expanded by leaps and bounds. During the 80s and continuing through the 90s, through the present, scholarship on black history has blossomed with different subfields and all this great type of stuff. Graduate students are increasingly specializing in different fields under the guidance of various generations of black historians from those of us who were socialized during the Civil Rights Black Power Movement to those of us who were socialized during the black cultural movement of the 80s and 90s. And I was talking to my friend Scott Brown about this, about being at Cornell during that crucial time mm -hmm. and how it shaped the consciousness and how that shapes the teaching of our generation. During the new millennium, several generations of scholars born during and after the black power era, what I like to call you know, hip hop generation black historians have added our little nuances to these previous models. As the generation of historians that I think I belong to, which I hope I can, you know, spread out depending on how we define generation, and those succeeding us, as we continue to define our roles in history and Africana studies and the U.S. Academy as a whole, I believe that we can draw inspiration from the activism and scholarship of, of Dr. Harris and his generation. Thank you very much. Exemplifiers of intellectual activism. Thank you, thank you. I'm going to need it. Oh, hello, everybody. It's really my honor to be here on this auspicious occasion to celebrate the legacy 
of my good friend and colleague, Dr. Robert Harris, who I will be seeing more regularly in the future. <laughs> because he's moving to Missouri. 15 minutes from where I live. Can you hear me? Okay. Historiographical development in African American women's history began in the 1970s with mainstream non women of color taking the lead by applying historiographical approaches used in the study of middle class white women. Soon after, Black women historians in particular attempted to lift what some of us call the, quote, white filter, unquote, in the study of African American women. Several theoretical approaches were tested during the early 1970s, including Marxist, black nationalist, and womanist theoretical approaches. <coughs> However, neither approach seemed to fit social science analysis of black women's experiences over time, or within the time perspective and methodologies used by historians. My work diverged from earlier paradigms. By the late 1970s, I conceptualized a nationalist feminist theoretical approach, which views black women in the United States from inside of their communities looking out rather than from outside of their communities looking in. Furthermore, the analysis focuses on women and their activities, as well as analysis of women's voices speaking to socio-political events in their own communities, as well as in the broader society. However, my first major publication to use the concept as a theoretical approach appeared in 1998 African American Women and the Struggle for the Vote, 1850 to 1920. Today, applying the nationalist feminist paradigm to my symposium theme of 19th century African American women intellectuals allows interpretations for both the abstract intellectual ideas of the two women selected for my case studies, as well as their application of activism both political and social. I argue that ideas alone did not make the women significant. Their own experiences advised them, and their use of persuasion was a key factor in their activism, which exemplifies intellectualism as well. Among 19th century women, I have chosen Frances Ellen Watkins Harper, as a case study for the 1860s to 1890s, and Frances Barrier, Frances Fanny Barrier Williams, as a case study for the 1890s. The causes each championed included the anti-slavery movement, the Reconstruction Era Equal Suffrage Movement, and the anti-defamation of black women movement in post-Reconstruction America nationwide. In recent years, the life and intellectual work of Frances Ellen Watkins Hopper has been studied primarily by literary critics rather than by historians, perhaps because Frances Hopper has best been known during these centuries as a poet and novelist rather than as a teacher and activist. Few have written in-depth studies about her, and when they reference her life and work, most cite William Still's chapter about Harper in his book, The Underground Railroad, first published in 1872. Some also cite the undocumented article about Watkins Harper, written by Betty Collier Thomas in the 1997 anthology African American Women and the Vote. Although some writers criticize Watkins Harper as a privileged quote, integrationist, <coughs> unquote, because she attended many integrated in conventions with white activists, both abolitionists and supporters of women's rights, I disagree with this characterization. <coughs> Watkins Harper was freeborn in Baltimore, did not have employment opportunities in the city outside of domestic service before the Civil War. Historians of antebellum black life understand that for the most part, life for free 
born black people was not one of privilege and leisure, despite what some literary, literary critics assume. Frances Watkins attended the Watkins Academy. Her uncle, the Reverend William Watkins Sr., not Jr., because there were two, the Reverend William Watkins Sr.'s school. At age 13, Frances began her work as a domestic servant in white homes. However, in 1851, she left Baltimore, aspiring to become a teacher. Watkins Harper departed a Baltimore a year before the uncle who raised an educator and educated her lost his home to the city of Baltimore under policies of eminent domain. In 1852, Watkins immigrated with his wife and several <coughs> sons to Canada. The following year, the Maryland legislature passed a law outlawing freeborn black people living in the North from returning or entering the state without fear of being enslaved. Consequently, the William Watkins family members who left Maryland, including Francis, could not return to the state until after the Civil War. At the age of 26, Watkins Harper had been well educated. Nonetheless, she had a difficult time finding permanent employment as a sewing teacher. Like Sojourner Truth in 1850, Watkins Harper often attended reform conventions outside of the South, where white reformers met. Both black women attended because they supported the causes, but I argue, also in order to sell their products. Truth sold self-images on small card or high cards or hired herself out as a camp laundress. You can see many of the uh, cards represented in, in Margaret Washington's biography. Watkins Harper sold her books of poetry. Perhaps the primary motive for attending the racially integrated venues was sales among the affluent reformers who found purchasing black photos and poetry exotic. <laughs> Acts such as these did not make either truth or Watkins Harper so-called integrationists, as some have indicated. I consider them to be or to, to have been entrepreneurial reformers. How then can we locate Watkins Harper's nationalist feminist politics within what she wrote or what was written about her, especially since most of her publications were fiction? Now, Painter argues that Harper's pro-black rather than pro-woman views during the Reconstruction years at equal suffrage and women's suffrage meetings alienated Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, the leaders of the women's rights movement. Painter argues that they wrote Watkins Harper out of the women's suffrage proceedings that they later remembered. However, some primary evidence has survived, and I argue that she spoke indirectly to her nationalist feminist opinions. We can see her commentary about enslaved women in several of her early poems. The one I found most revealing about the plight of enslaved women and their children was written in 1856, following an actual event, the tragic Margaret Garner murder case. The poem, The Slave Mother, A Tale of Ohio, which is different from The Slave Woman, which was an earlier poem, was written in 1856. Watkins Harper recalled an infanticide case suggesting her early nationalist feminist worldview as she identifies with the enslaved mother who kills her child rather than see her a slave and live enslaved and sexually abused, as was Margaret's case. This event, which inspired Watkins Harper to write, may have been the beginning of the nationalist feminist worldview. A decade later, the enslaved and rebelling states had been emancipated, the Civil War had ended, and the 13th Amendment ratified, which emancipated, as you know, all remaining enslaved. 
In the meantime, Watkins Harper lived in Ohio, where she married a farmer, Fenton Harper, a widower with three children. Frances gave birth to her only child, but she was widowed and impoverished a few years later. He says, we're not talking about leisure here. Soon after, her home base became Philadelphia. There she worked with William Still, and her reform and income efforts focused on the equal suffrage movement, which was organized to achieve universal suffrage, not merely Negro suffrage, as it was called, for men, or woman suffrage, primarily for white women. During the mid to late 1860s, the controversy over which movement took precedence revealed that Harper took the nationalist position, as did Frederick Douglass. She argued that she wanted the right to vote. But if both black men and women could not win a constitutional amendment at the same time, she preferred to let the men go first. Her intellectual position clearly defined her in the nationalist feminist camp. In 1866, Harper spoke during the 11th Women's Rights Convention held in New York City and organized by Stanton and Anthony. Her speech called All Bound Up Together was Harper's angry, and I, I, when I read it, I said, whoa, this woman's angry, angry discourse, not only with cries for women to be equal under the law with men, but also indictments against white women for acquiescing to many of the wrongs perpetuated against black people. For example, Harper argued for normal school education for all women, quote, Talk of giving women the ballot box? Go on. It is a normal school, and the white women of the country need it. While there exists this brutal element in society which tramples upon the feeble and treads down the weak, I tell you that if there is any class of people who need to be lifted out of their airy nothings and selfishness, it is the white women of America." Unquote. Not surprisingly, Harper alienated women suffrage leaders who failed to include her speech in the official proceedings. Her words throughout the speech nevertheless reflected nationalist feminism. However, in the 1870s, Harper traveled to the reconstructed South to help with work freeborn blacks provided emancipated people. Her observations and analysis of political views among freed women can be seen through her poems in dialect about Aunt Chloe. My favorite one finds Chloe discussing her views on politics, both the good and the bad, reflecting what I call nationalist, national feminism, nationalist feminism. Quote, of course I don't know very much about these politics, but I think that some who run them do mighty ugly tricks. When we want to school our children, if the money isn't there, whether black or white have took it, the loss we all must share. And this buying up each other is something worse than mean. Though I think a heap of voting, I go for voting clean. Yeah. Although Harper was an entrepreneur by the end of the Construction, she was also an intellectual and the ultimate reformer. She was drawn to several causes, including the temperance movement, which she encouraged black people to join. Consequently, in the 1880s, she joined the Women's Christian Temperance Union, the, the, C, the WCTU, I get it all tied up, the WCTU, another organization patronized by affluent people who could pay to hear her speak and buy her books of poetry. The times were right for educated black women, many of them born free, to embrace the cult of respectability, especially as whites celebrated defamation of black women's character. So this is not in a vacuum, just wanting to be, you know, respectable. This mm -hmm. definitely had a, had a chaser in there. Temperance exhortations were symptomatic of this trend. 
Harper complained about the race prejudice among the white female temperance leaders in particular, yet she aspired to leadership positions in the segregated organization and received pay for the position. The segregated unions, however, enabled her to work with and influence black people, a goal she sought. During the 1880s, Harper wrote articles for the AME Church Review. In 1888, Harper wrote, quote, for years I knew little of its proceedings and was not sure that colored comradeship was very desirable. But having attended a local union in Philadelphia, I was asked to join and acceded to the request and was made city and afterwards state superintendent of work among colored people. Since then, for several years, I have held the position of national superintendent of work among colored people of the North. For several years thereafter, Harper was the only black person on the WCTU national level. Perhaps she accepted such a position as a challenge to racism because she commented about it in several venues. In 1889, Harper submitted her WCTU report not only to the organizational leadership, but also to the M AME Church Review where it was published. She noted that certain attitudes prevailed among the members of the so-called colored unions, and this is interesting, reflecting race identity among black women on the one hand, but the prevalence of discrimination against them by white women on the other. Discussing such issues in a black forum provided information to educated African Americans about social welfare policies made by influential white women. The advent of the black women's club movement in the 1890s allowed Harper new venues for socio-political action. During this period, Frances Ellen Watkins Harper's life intersected with Fanny Barrier Williams. In 1893, both Harper and Barrier Williams accepted invitations to speak during the World's Congress of Representative Women in Chicago. Harper's speech was entitled, Women's Political Future, a hopeful but challenging message to the delegates, wherein she called for U.S. Congress to enact a federal education bill to enable facilities and teachers for the formerly enslaved. Freedmen's Bureau was over by this point. At the Congress, she used a device by alternately speaking indirectly to both black and white women in the audience. To white women, she spoke using the African-American meta-language of her generation, within words such as womanhood and women referred to white. Quote, political life in our country has plowed in muddy channels and needs the infusion of clearer and clean, cleaner waters. I am not sure that women are naturally so much better than men that they will clear the stream by the virtue of their womanhood. It is not through sex, but through character that the best influence of women upon the life of the nation must be exerted. And in that case, womanhood and women were referring to white women. Later in her talk, she spoke covertly to African American women using words such as women of any race to signal black women that she was addressing them when she said, quote, all women of America, into your hands God has pressed one of the sublimest opportunities that ever came into the hands of the women of any race or people. It is yours to create a healthy public sentiment, to demand justice, simple justice, as the right of every race, to brand with everlasting infamy the lawless and brutal cowardice that lynches, burns, and tortures your own countrymen." Unquote. At age 68, Harper was bridging the abolitionist era generation with the woman suffrage era generation as she forecast 
the anti-lynching movement that would follow a few years later, and the growing expressions of nationalist feminism among her cohorts in the African American Women's Club movement, one of whom would be Fanny Barrier Williams. Historians have written little about the life of Fanny Barrier Williams. There are several sketches of her life written in biographical dictionaries and in encyclopedias since the 1970s, but there is no scholarly biography. In 2002, sociologist Mary Jo Deegan published a collection with some of Williams' writings and a lengthy introduction which does not characterize Williams' political or social views within any particular paradigm. In my opinion, Sunni Onyanta educator June Edwards wrote the most significant of the biographical sources in the 2013 edition of the Dictionary of Unitarian and Universalist Biography. Edwards took Deegan to task for neglecting to include Barry Williams' writings in African-American publications. See, if you didn't know that, you, you, would, you would, wouldn't assume it. Frances Barrier was born in 1855, 30 years after the birth of Frances Ellen Watkins. Fanny, as she was called, was in Frances Harper's daughter's generation. But unlike Mary Harper, who was born impoverished in Ohio, Fanny lived in a stable middle class family in Rockport, New York, down the road. Her father was a barber, a common 19th century profession among black men whose clientele was white men. Fanny was raised in a Baptist home. In Rockport, Fanny Barrier and her siblings were educated in public schools populated primarily by white students. And Fanny earned her teaching degree from the Rockport Normal School, today's SUNY Rockport. After teaching for a while in post-Reconstruction Georgia, Fanny met and married lawyer Lane Williams. They resettled in Chicago, where the couple joined All Souls Unitarian Church, one of several Unitar Unitarian Universalist churches in the nation that African Americans attended, with, and they, had, they all had the same name, All Souls. Although Barrier Williams wrote that she faced no racial prejudice growing up in Rockport, racial discrimination found her once she graduated from college and left the town. June Edwards quoted Barrier Williams' 1904 autobiography. And this is the last sentence in the biography. Whether I live in the North or the South, I cannot be counted for my full value, unquote. Although Barry Williams lived between black and white worlds, her life experiences determined her intellectual and socio-political ideology as nationalist feminist. Like Harper in Barry, Barry Williams' speeches, she often spoke indirectly to those in the audience who were black and those who were white. I think this was a device used by many African Americans. According to historians Catherine Kish Slar and Aaron Shaughnessy, I think this is really Shaughnessy's work, Barrier Williams, quote, represents the respectable portion of the reform spectrum in contrast to the insistent and harsh criticisms offered by Ida B. Wells and Frederick Douglass, unquote. And making this assessment, probably Shaughnessy referenced a statement made by Barry Williams as she addressed the primarily white audience in 1893, where Harper also spoke. Of Barry Williams, Slar and Shaughnessy wrote, quote, she claims that African American women have no interest in social equality, and adds that she has no, quote, disposition to take our place in the Congress as fault finders or supplicants for mercy, unquote. Theirs is a problematic assessment because, because it is out of context on two levels. Wells, number one, Wells and Douglas had criticized Chicago's World's Fair organizers for their lack 
of African American women's representation in the United States exhibition, also held in 1893. Some of you might know about that. Unlike Wells and Douglas, Beria Williams was not involved in the subsequent controversy. Secondly, the incomplete statement Shaughnessy, I believe, quoted, changed Barrier Williams' actual meaning, which her complete statement below clarifies. Quote, but there is no wish to overstate the obstacles to colored women or to picture their status as hopeless. There is no disposition to take our place in the Congress as fault finders or supplicants for mercy. As women of a common country with common interests and a destiny that will certainly bring us closer to each other, we come to this altar with our contributions of hopeless, hopefulness as well as our complaints." Unquote. As you can see, Barry Williams expressed her complaints in a nationalist feminist framework that dismissed the dread of quote, social equality, unquote, about which white women feared. If we examine other segments of Barry Williams' speech at the Women's Congress, you hear critique of white women, similar to those written by Harper about the WCTU. The recurring themes of respectability versus defamation were evident among circles of educated black women reformers and intellectuals in the 1890s. A segment of Barrier Williams' address, apparently directed to the black delegates attending the Congress, reveals a nationalist feminist critique. Quote, I regret the necessity of speaking to the question of moral progress of our women, because the morality of our home life has been commented upon so disparagingly and meanly that we are placed in the unfortunate position of being defenders of our name. The question of the moral progress of colored women in the United States has force and meaning in this discussion only so far as it tells the story how the once enslaved women have been struggling for 25 years to emancipate themselves from the demoralization of their enslavement, unquote. Barrier Williams also directed her strong critique to the white congressional delegates, quote, it is almost literally true that except teaching in colored schools and menial work, colored women can find no employment in this free America. They are the only women in the country for whom real ability, virtue, and special talents count for nothing when they become applicants for respectable employment. Taught everywhere in ethics and social economy that merit always wins, colored women carefully prepare themselves for all kinds of occupations, only to meet the stern refusal, rebuff, and disappointment." In this segment, she spoke forcibly about the fault lines in American race relations and perceptions. Barrier Williams' words appeared to be nationalist feminists, as did those of Frances Ellen Watkins in her presentation to the same Congress delegates. By the mid-1890s, Barrier Williams had found her cohort of educated slash activist African-American women, as did Harper. In 1895, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin had convened the first National Black Women's Club Convention in Boston, the National Federation of Afro-American Afro Women. According to Barry Williams, over 100 women met representing 25 clubs from 10 different states. The immediate issue was the defamation of black women's name by members of white society. However, other issues such as women's suffrage nationwide and the convict lease labor system in the South met with discussion also. The following year, two rival national groups, the Federation and the Colored Women's League, met in the District of Columbia to negotiate a merger. Eventually, in 1896, the two federations dissolved to form a consolidated federation. 
the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, which still exists today. In her 1899 article, Beria Williams discussed one of the reasons many African-American women interested in the National Women's Club movement joined the Black National Federation. Heretofore, they were discriminated against in their club's attempts to join with white women in their national federation. Beria Williams claimed white club women are fearful of their federation becoming Africanized. As a result, she said, whites drew the color line. However, Barry Williams believed that the controversy helped black women. And with nationalist feminist reasoning, she wrote, quote, it can be said that colored women have gained more than they have lost by this widespread controversy as to their fitness for membership in white clubs. Through the justice of the press, the best things among colored women and the best women have been brought into the public notice to an extent that never could have been gained by other means." Unquote. An activist, nationalist, feminist, I argue, at the turn of the century, Barry Williams wrote articles for the Woman's Era, a black woman's newspaper in Boston, published by the aging Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin and her daughter, Larda Ridley. The struggle continued with another generation of nationalist feminists coming to the fore. Thank you. Do you know if that's true? 
do you think you need to figure out? Is that true? I have things on my plate. I can't <laughs> start a project about Jet Magazine and sexuality and gender projects, politics. But I'm thinking, you know, just put it on the side of your desk and think about it later. Come in another time. Got all these, got all these advertisements with interracial uh, couples. All these white men with black women being advertised all of a sudden. This strikes me as odd. When did this start? What does this mean? What is the significance of this? I can't study it, but here you go. I literally have a corner of my desk that is Bob Harris delivered uh, rich research projects that I actually have every intention of exploring in some way, shape, or a, a, a form. So uh, I'm a recent convert, but I am evangelical. <laughs> in my faith and belief in, in Bob Harris. Just very, very briefly. Um, as I read and listened to these two papers, I, I, so I'm not in the hip hop generation, I'm a little bit after, but I kind of got a foot in the hip hop generation, and for some reason, what uh, kept running through my mind, so I have soundtracks that narrate my life, right? I don't always share the soundtracks of my life, but I'm gonna do it right here because I think it makes a difference. Um, was this song by a group from the 80s called In Vogue that my students have never heard of. Right? I mentioned them, they're sort of like, who, what? I start making the actual people. Uh, they're like, you know their names? Like, not only do you know this group nobody has heard of, but you know they're actually somebody named Cindy? Who is that, right? Um, there was a song on one of their uh, albums at the time, <laughs> CDs, called Free Your Mind. Um, and the words, the words that kept running through my mind was before you can read me, you've got to learn how to see me, right? It was just free your mind and the rest will follow. Honestly, as I read these two papers and as I listened to them, that was the soundtrack that was being narrated. Because where both of them sort of are joined um, are a call for people who are gonna study the history, um, I would say the present, of, of African Americans to know how to read you before they can see, right? Both of them are very much concerned with, with taking seriously uh, in, in Professor Dag, Dag Bovee, I'm missing it. No, that's not. What is it though? Dag Bovee. Dag Bovee. Yes. <laughs> Professor Dag Bovee, I'm sensitive to it. My name's no leeway, people screw it up. So I'm sensitive <laughs> to exactly <laughs> how you say uh, people's names. Uh, Professor Dag Bovee, in using Professor Harris's The Arc of His Scholarship, which begins in a period where, where scholars had to literally clear a space to talk about who black people were. Uh, one of my other scholar mentors, uh, Nell Painter, who has given me permission to call her Nell, so I'll call her Nell, wrote what I think is a brilliant art for, for me, is a classic text in African American history, uh, which is Slavery and Soul Work. In there, she talks about the, the historiography, the development of African American history. And what she says is real quick, it's the last thing I'm going to say, because again, I'm not reading, I'm narrating, but I want you to think about this. And that comes to my question. Um, what the arc that she lays out has to do with black scholars, having black scholars of African American history having to first respond to Stanley Elkins' 1959 slavery. Um, which set up an identity for black people as pathological. It said slavery was so damaging to the black psyche. It was so encompassing. There was no place for black people to run, no space for them to be free. It damaged their psyche, and that damage translated to the psyches of their descendants. There were, of course, some people who responded to it, but this text was so influential in 1959 before affirmative action, before you have large numbers of black people getting PhDs so that they can speak back to power from a position of equality, right? It's not that we didn't speak back before, but it's different to speak back as a tenured professor at UCLA, at Yale, at Cornell, than it is to speak back from Howard, unfortunately. Right, so what she says is the, the whole historiography, the whole thinking about black people, was, was um, uh, about black people in history had to do with this kind of thing, and of black people's pathological, such that you saw in 1965, Daniel Patrick Moynihan literally said the reason he came up with the analysis, with his analysis for the Moynihan Report, um, which talked about a tangle of pathology 
in black communities, which talked about um, black women as demasculating black men, um, and which talked about just damage that <laughs> needed to be addressed. He says, I got this thinking, not from the history that we have laid out before us by black men and black women, um, that these scholars from the 70s have, were excavating um, at that time, or, or scholars before 1965 had been excavated, but from this Elkins book, right? And that book set social policy. It was no small thing that a historian in 1955, 59, called us pathological. It was no small thing. So what, what Neil Painter says is before scholars could um, talk about black empowerment, um, they first had to deal with that. And so you have a whole generation who talks about the black family, right? Talks about black communities in certain kinds of ways, because you had to, you had to resuscitate us um, before you could do anything else. The question that I have again, narrated, there was more nuance, but I want to get to question and answer. But so the question that I have, um, really for both of you, is: Is there a way though that, uh, as time has passed? Because you know your your uh, your your piece is also very much about black women responding to ideas about black female immorality, pathology, being outside of respectable true womanhood. Right, we're not part of the mainstream. Is it that that kind of pathology thesis has been allowed to creep back into contemporary America? And what is the reason um, that it doesn't seem to? Are there issues with the fact that it's not so much on the table for black scholars or black people, black historians, right? We don't have to do that anymore. Prove black people are not pathological. Um, we shouldn't. We've moved on, right? We're moving on to transnational work. We've left urban America in large part. You know, we talked earlier about how the move in history is outside of the US and certainly outside of urban America. And yet, we we're watching or hearing about pathology coming back in, and I'm wondering um, where, as, as a non-historian, don't claim historian <laughs> um, by messing around in it, I'm wondering wh where, where the field is going such that you could make the same kind of claim that there's a collective response um, to what is arguably an attack on the black psyche. So much so that you would have a black president that would go to uh, Professor Harris's beloved Chicago and in response to talking about the death of black children, the murders of black children, suggests that if there were more black families, if there were strong black families, not policy, not the absence of policy, or not the need to enact policy, but address your pathology, we'll fix this, right? Or, or the ways that, uh, when I'm not here, I live in New York, and there's all of these um, billboards about telling black women, you need to stop having these babies out of wedlock because you're, you're, you're not going to get educated. Uh, you're, you're not going to have any money. He's not going to stay with you. The black babies are narrating to their mothers. Um, this thing about your pathology is going to set my life back. And so I, I wonder, uh, my one question, I'll just leave it there, really is, is where are we in terms of, where are y'all, <laughs> in terms of the historical profession, in terms of a generational shift? What part of what you do now is or should be aimed at addressing what looks to be um, the changing thing.
never going away. It's always going to be there. I hate to admit that. But um, this is America. <laughs> it's apple pie to talk about us like we're nothing. I hate to say it, but that's the reality. Of it. We can be hopeful that sometimes it looks like things are going to get better, but a lot of times we just, not we, the society falls back into the, its normalcy. And um, we get that all the time. Um, Melissa Harris Perry, how many of you are familiar with her show on MSNBC? She's doing a little uh, commercial these days about the greeting cards her father used to send her. Have you seen that? And she says, when I was little, I used to get these cards from my father, and it didn't say, love dad. It said, the struggle continues. And she says, well, now I get it. I didn't get it then. But, and I was, I was in it. She's got it. And we, we got to pass that on. The struggle has to continue because it, the problems will never really be. I hate to be that pessimistic, but I don't see in my lifetime, which will probably be over sooner than most of yours, but I don't see it changing. So we have to constantly struggle against it. Well, there are several things that popped into my mind when you started posing your question, and so let me just go with the things that came into my head to begin with. Um, the, the first thing that I thought about was, was Manning Marvel's whole notion of, of black studies as being an intellectual tradition and having various different elements, and one of the elements being corrective. And when we think of corrective in the 21st century, we think it's something archaic. That we, we don't need to be vindicationist anymore. We're way beyond that. But the corrective approach is, is still very much needed. Um, um, you know, there, there are certain types of, of, of history that we might say is, is blatantly racist if we're quote unquote oversensitive, but there's a lot of omission that takes place, a lot of just total omission that takes place in the historical profession. And when I talked about publishing in mainstream venues and the challenges, if you have a certain type of perspective in black history behind that, I, I don't think that's something to be taken lightly. Um, I've had personally several different experiences, and I'm not gonna say that I was just rejected because they didn't want to include my stuff that was dealing with black people, but I kind of do want to say that. Um, especially a recent incident that I had with the Journal of American History that I could talk about later, but it was interesting because I, let me just say, I was hired by the um, Organization of American Historians and the National Park Service Department of Interior to write a historical manual for the Carter G. Woodson home. And historically, they published the article that you produce in the Journal of American History. I submitted mine, it was well done, I believe so, didn't have typos, and I was told that it wouldn't even set out for review and that it was too narrow of a topic. And you know, at the same time, I'm reading about chimney sweeps in Philadelphia in 17. 25, and I'm wondering if that's too narrow of a topic. Um, but anyway, talking about the, the pathology piece, um, when you mentioned the whole thing of the pathology, I, I think that, that, that's, that's timely, because CNN has been doing these things on black America, state of black America, and they portray us as being all messed up, like to have a smile is a covenant. Every statistical analysis were messed up, right? Um, pick up, you know, books on incarceration, on AIDS, HIV. And that's where I think that the historian has the role to explain this. Um, historians can deconstruct why these present day problems exist today. I'm not a total deconstructionist, but I kind of am. That if you break things down, you can see that there are clear historical roots to the, the present day you know, realities. And I think that's one thing that we have, have to focus on. The last thing I'll say is that I think we have to be concerned more with popular culture. I think that's one of the things that we're getting in terms of portraying and being pathological. Um, the, the fact that Django and Lincoln um, were celebrated for historians should be at least somewhat problematic. Even though when I went to see Django, I didn't take it even seriously and didn't get it as a historian because I didn't look at it like that. But when kids look at this stuff as history, that's when we have to really intervene. And people really don't like history too much. But I'm I'm really trying to understand it again because I'm not a trained historian that kind of history. Um, and so when I understand periods of history, I understand methodology of certain texts, like the training that goes into different disciplinary fields. 
uh, is always sort of set against the big concerns in those fields. At different periods, it changes, right? I mean, the, the concerns change. The, I'm wondering for now, for historians, for the folks that you're training now and those that you trained right before you retired, right? What's the relationship to um, some of what Professor Harris talked about, about the responsibility of history and the teaching of history and the, um, to help the whole point of the project is you laid out some of what he had said. I don't know if he still agrees with it, but in the 70s, or in the 80s. So you were in the 70s and 80s, he thought that it had a, it was part of a political project, right? And not just a, um, so, so a, a, a set of information. I think it depends on where you are uh, across the nation, but I think in general terms that I don't think it's an elephant in the room that there's this preoccupation with tenure and promotion and maybe becoming famous. I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but there doesn't seem to be that requirement to be active. I mean, back in the day, at certain points, if you know your department is explicitly racist or journals are explicitly racist, it's right in your face you're going to confront it. But when it's more subtle, you might miss it and um, you might not think that that link is there anymore. And there's been this decrease in social mission, I would think, with black intellectuals. New York Times, they were talking about, you know, black intellectuals not too long ago and them being social activists, the, the role of the public intellectual and being socially active has, has decreased. And how we define being socially active and what's militant has definitely decreased. Because it's not just about writing a book or getting on CNN when Barack Obama is president. Um, it, it's, a, it's a lot deeper and there's got to be a commitment to teaching. And so I think a lot of times people put other stuff first. And I'll just say this in closing. Remember how much beef Adolf Reed, um, who I might disagree with from some time, but how much beef he got when he critiqued public intellectuals for supposedly, quote unquote, pimping the problems of black people in the same way that Booker T. Washington did of Du Bois when Booker T. said to Du Bois, you know, you'd be, happy, you'd be unhappy if the, the Negro problem was solved because then you wouldn't have a job. Um, so at one level, our jobs as historians and Black studies practitioners is there because of the situation, yet the social responsibility piece is sometimes lacking. Well, one of the differences I think is how you're trained, especially if you're getting a PhD. And I would tell my students at the I want to I said, look, this is an exercise. Your dissertation is an exercise. You do what you are told you have to so you can get your membership card. Then, when you get your membership card, you write what you want to write and hope that somebody will want to publish it. That is one of the problems. <laughs> what would you say? After, after, well, see, that's the problem. When I started teaching in the 70s, basically, you got a job, you had a, I, I, I was an instructor. That's what, you know, we started there. You weren't assistant professor with PhD. You started as an instructor, especially if you were at a teaching rather than a research university. After a while, you applied for tenure based on a variety of things, including going back to school to work on your PhD if you didn't have one. There was not this craziness that you've got to, as soon as you get out of graduate school, you've got to publish something so that you can qualify for an assistant professorship. With, there were no tenure track positions back in this. Maybe there were at some of these big universities, but at the state schools, they wanted an instructor whose specialty was X, Y, and Z, who had good references, and maybe had taught somewhere before. It wasn't in your track. Now, you're, you're hired either as a contractual person, as called lecturer, right? Am I right? There's no more instructors. I don't think they advertise for instructors anymore. So things have changed. And the kinds of things that we looked at, Bob, in the 70s were possible because you weren't constricted. Your politics wasn't constricted because the main goal was to get tenure or you will lose your job. That was not the goal. So now that things have changed, I'm so glad I don't have to go through that. Seriously, because I'd never have a job. <laughs> because I, you know, my mouth is too big and I've got to speak my mind and I have to be political with a lot of the stuff that I do. So, um, but today, to have to 
tell your PhD students, this is just an exercise. Do not look at it that, I mean, you've got to do your job. You've got to do what we want you to do. Then you can do what you want to do once you finish. And, and it, once you get tenured, you're right. So the whole, and it's not even, because then it was you get your PhD. It wasn't, and then you get tenure. When has the tenure thing been so bad? Since the 90s or the 80s? When has it been so competitive and so crazy? I don't know. I've lost concept of when. 90s, you think? Does any, yeah? Oh, I, I you gonna know. answer my question? I don't think I was gonna speak to that. I, I was just trying to signal that I, I had a question. Yeah. Okay. okay, we'll open it up now then. Um, okay. Oh. No. Okay, yeah. Okay, this is just a, a, a quick question for both of you, and I guess it has to do with no other ways question about teaching. Um, Roslyn, if you could just say a little bit about your thinking around the term nationalist feminist and what's behind that and um, how that might be one strategy of, of communicating to uh, students who may have complicated ideas about the relationship of African American history to women's history. And um, Haro, if you could just talk about, or say a little bit more about the issue you raised about the relationship of African American history to students, and in particular black students. Obviously there are not as many black students as there were uh, in perhaps the heyday of, of black studies, but if you could speak to that as well. So that's just for both. Want me to start? I have two paradigms that I use, depending on whether I'm doing the diaspora or whether I'm doing black America. So African feminism is the other paradigm, which I can apply in the US situation. But when I'm doing the black world, that's, that's the focus. And that's Philomena Steady's concept. That's not mine. Um, it's really the black nationalist feminist, but that's too long. So I just shorten it to nationalist, which is a takeoff from the black nationalist perspective, except it brings women in there in a more significant way, that women are centered in that. And if you're doing African American women and African American meaning US women, I found that to be good. Um, I usually teach a variety, give students a variety of paradigms. I don't limit it to that. I say, people use this, people use that, people use this and that, but I find this is most helpful in the way I want to look at the lives of black women and how they themselves attempted to make change. But see, that's also a political position. But hey, it's my, my. <laughs> So, so, and a lot of students like that. Um, of course, they also like, part, I like postmodernism also in certain segments of it, like the whole question of identity gets in there. And I, and I, and I tell them, you can borrow from various paradigms to put your things together. Um, and all my, most, most of my PhD, no, I'd say half of my PhD students were males not writing about it even though some were. So they have to find their own uh, particular way of doing it. So mine is not a universal thing because a lot of my, my PhD students were not working on black women's history. Well, that's a good question about <coughs> students today. Um, I, I have uh, three kids, two of them who are in high school and one who's in junior high, and, and they don't like to ask me questions about history from their textbook because they don't want to rattle on for like four or five minutes and you know, the subtext. Um, and they're not too different than, than the college uh, students that I'm dealing with. I've, I've been grad director now for three years, so I've been removed from a lot of undergrad teaching, but I used to do it a whole lot. I'll get back to it. And I came of age going to undergrad or grad school from the period of like 89 through 99. And maybe it's just my nostalgia, but 
we were, we were conscious back then. I mean, the hip hop had a lot of historical revivalism in it. You know, there was the speaker series with Asante, Francis Crest, Wellesley, Naeem Akbar, all, Dr. Ben, all yes, these like yes. nationalist, you know, activist scholars who would come and we would, I mean, Van Seer, we would go listen to these folks and like be like, yeah, you know, mm. red, black, and green medallions. I mean, we were down, we thought yeah. the stuff was deep. <laughs> and um, I don't know when it's changed, but. The, the young folk today, I don't want to sound too old, but you know, the younger folk today, there's there's no historical revivalism in the hip hop music that they listen to or in their subculture that I, that I think is an important reason of this. And if they do want some of that historical revivalism and consciousness in the hip hop, they gotta get dig deep into the underground with Dead Press and Mortal Technique and other artists like that. So I think it has a lot to do with the period that they're socialized in. And I don't think that we as historical figures in any period of time can jump too far outside of those circumstances that are molding us. Um, that's what we have to do to change, but most people are not willing to do that. So I think as teachers, we have to go above and beyond, far beyond the call of duty. And it's, it's very exhausting because we sometimes have to go down to their level to, to, to explain stuff. Like if you want to talk about blues women, you might have to talk about Nicki Minaj and twist it a little bit so that they can be like, oh, I understand, and they can get interested. And it's kind of scary. Um, it's kind of scary that you have to do that, but to make history relevant to, to each generation, the farther it gets removed from that last period of consciousness that most people claim was like the black power era or Afrocentric movement, it's very challenging. Um, and I don't blame the young folk because, because it's subtle. They just don't get it. They think that Barack Obama being president is like changing things, and they don't even put him within the context of black political leadership going back to the period of Reconstruction. To make a long answer short, it's a very challenging test that if you want to work really close with millennial learners, you got to do a whole lot more than we used to do. Um, I read your book when I was um, just coming out of the one I'm lifting the race, just coming out of, uh, of, of undergrad through grad school. And when I first read it, I didn't, I didn't understand it a whole lot. I wasn't equipped intellectually. If I were to try and give you know, a book, me like yours, with that theory to some of my students, they, they wouldn't get it at all. Um, but I tried. Um, this group just wants the fast food. Look, hold on, let me go check my iPhone. I get my information. <laughs> so you gotta counter all that stuff creatively and actively. You gotta tap into their mind to do it. And it's a challenging Johnson's test. It's only gonna get worse over time. Right? Let me exemplify this. How many of you know that students are not taught cursive anymore? I just learned that when my goddaughter's son graduated from high school in May. Okay. And his mother wrote a nice, his grandmother, my good friend wrote a nice little note on the card. He looks at the card, takes the money out, and thanks her, and puts the card in his pocket. And she says, well, aren't you going to read it? He says, well, I really have to spend some time on that because I don't know cursive. And of course, she was appalled. And so she asked her daughter, she said, they don't teach that anymore. They assume everybody knows how to text and go on the computer and do all so that's part of the problem, too. Those of us who were taught cursive understand that you can also write as well as, and not even type, puck and pluck and whatever. <laughs> it's, it's, this is a new, the new world is coming in, and it's coming so fast that segments of us don't even know, you know. I, you know, I said, you don't, do they teach you printing? I think they do print, you do learn printing in elementary school, right? But we learn cursive in elementary school. If you go to private school, they teach you cursive, right? Catholic school, if you go to public school. Public school, right. You do not learn And the majority of students go to public school. Don't they? Yeah. Margaret, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, I, I had a, a question about the Black Power era and the Reconstruction. I really love what you said about Harper, because, you know, she and Sojourner travel together in the late 1850s and um, around Michigan, the, the, the Detroit River Basin. Oh, I uh, that. Yeah, and so uh, that 
that's, uh, and then and later on when she's dictating letters, she always tells her friends that when I get my new house, I want Miss Watkins to come. So, you know, they have this uh, a very close relationship. Um, I, I also wanted to make a little corrective about this pathology because uh, it's popularized, the problem is this, it's popularized by Stanley Elkins. It actually comes from E. Franklin Frazier. Uh, African American sociologist. That's where the tangle of pathology comes from. That's where Elkins got it from. If you go to Elkins and look at who he cites, it's Frazier. Uh, and then that's where that. So, so it, it started out as policy because uh, E. Franklin Frazier, as a sociologist, was helping. Um, what's the Swedish sociologist? Oh, uh, her, her helping Myrtle. Of, uh, this book uh, on American Dilemma. Right, on American Dilemma. So, uh, out of that uh, research came this idea and then some other damaging things. But anyway, self criticism uh, among African Americans is important as well uh, in terms of, of how we see ourselves and how we represent ourselves. Uh, because this tangled pathology comes from a black man. Um, but I wanted to ask a question, Roz, about your, the term nationalist feminist. Um, because when the way you talk about Harper, Professor Ellen Watkins Harper, she certainly is a nationalist, and she's obviously a feminist. She's also an integrationist. And so, and, and because I'm writing about black and white women now, uh, who work very closely together, and at the same time, uh, some of these black women are very strong nationalists. At the same time, they are working with white women. What, what, how do you characterize someone like that? You say she's a nationalist feminist, uh, but she also works very closely uh, with white women. The problem I have with the word, the definition of integrationist is maybe what it is. Because when we hear that word, at least when I hear it, I see something different than combining a variety of ways and methods of dealing with, with of one another. An integrationist, from the way I have been indoctrinated into the definition, is somebody that feels as though the Euro-American life is the way to go, and that's what you have to try to aspire to be. And as you do that, you shed your black. Now, I, I don't know, but that's how I have, have been sort of socialized to understand what the term means. And when a lot of people claim that she was, and they said the same of Fannie Berry, that she was an, an integrationist, it's because they are in white world. Mm -hmm. But just because you're dealing in a white world or have white friends doesn't necessarily mean that you feel that your blackness is irrelevant and that you need to discard that and become like they are. So you said we need a new term? This was so. a problem that you boys ran up against in the second stint of the uh, NAACP. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, great. So what do we mean by integration? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, I uh, just wanted to say, well, first of all, thank you uh, for the presentation. And the only way I didn't realize uh, that you had become converted, uh, I could have taken up a collection perhaps. <laughs> 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 I had known that. Uh, but at any rate, um, Carol, I mean, let's consider, I'm not saying necessarily that uh, this is your conclusion, but I think that you might be suggesting that I is a little more optimistic about the future of African American history. And that it's your sense that uh, there are rough winds ahead, let's say, something that we uh, need to be uh, aware of. But I'm very confident with you and Jessica and Mitch and Michelle and Scott that the future of African American history is in good hands. You're going to work it out in your way as we've worked it out in our way. But I'm confident.
but there are certain publishers that will, they just look askance at an African American historian uh, unless they get uh, you know, approval from a certain group of people, you know, with a man unnamed. But, you know, the, the profession is, is gerrymandered. With that, thank you. Uh, I'm going to have to stop right here. <laughs>